Welcome to a Spotlight Innovation episode where we feature two guests who will share how their innovative ideas are making a difference in the palliative care world. Our first guest, Yvonne Heath, is the founder of the Love Your Life to Death movement. She's an author, speaker, and change maker who talks about life, death, and grief. In her unique style mixed with heart and humor, we talk about how you don't need to do more than just show up wherever you are to make a difference. Our second guest, Dr. Alyssa Boyd, is a palliative care doctor who is the co-founder of the Living Wish Foundation, a community version of a Make-A-Wish Foundation for adults who are dying. We talk about the impact this has had on her community and how this can spread elsewhere. Hi, I'm Sien Xiao. And I'm Sammy Winemaker. We talk to people who have information and tips on how to unlock a better illness experience. The waiting room revolution starts right now. Yvonne, welcome to the podcast. <laughs> Thank you. It's so exciting to be here. Yvonne, so you are the founder of the Love Your Life to Death movement, which is all about reimagining how we deal with death and grief. So how did that all start? Well, it's one of those funny journeys, right? When you go into nursing school as a wonderfully naive person who's going to save people and it's going to be so amazing and you're so ill-prepared <laughs> for everything that you're actually going to experience. It's a lot different in a textbook than in real life, isn't it? <laughs> ah, yeah. So I had uh, 27 years of nursing. I went, uh, I graduated from Toronto East General, which is no longer Toronto East General or Centennial College. And uh, and I proceeded to become a, a nurse in Toronto and then a traveling nurse. And I just, I moved, I, I worked in all of these different areas. And then the last sort of from 2001 to 2015 in chemotherapy. And I learned so so much about what I didn't know. <laughs> and I realized in, in my own personal life and in my professional life, how ill-prepared I was for grief, death, and dying. And when we had tremendous grief in our lives, which it's interesting, as many people think grief is just about people dying, and grief is experienced in whatever makes your heart ache. So our older son went down a dangerous road of drugs and addictions. When he had an injury, his snowboarding dreams were crushed. And I realized that people were avoiding me. Healthcare professionals were avoiding me because they didn't know what to do and they didn't know what to say. And this was very uncomfortable. And I, you know, sort of looked around and said, where, where are my people? <laughs> so in chemotherapy, I started to pay more attention you know, are we having real conversations? And I realized we weren't. Can you relate to that? <laughs> yes, absolutely. This whole idea of avoiding the elephant in the room and and not knowing and, and that training of what to say and how to react. I mean, I think we just aren't prepared as a society to normalize this. And it just leads to all these sort of cascade, this cone of silence, really, mm. and, and all these unintended effects. So awesome. what so what so what was the next step? So you you realized there was a missing piece in your healthcare education and you wanted to make a change. So what did that look like? What was the next step in that journey? Well, it was just it's it's interesting because it's kind of like, you know, in the universe when people say, "Why do you why did you choose this journey?" I said, "No, no. It chooses you, right? Like you you it's like you can no longer be a part of the silence. You can no longer be a part of a system that doesn't know how to do this." And when you think about it, anything that we get good at or better at, what do we do? We practice, we learn, we have mentors, we have coaches, we get it wrong, we try again. And yet, when it comes to the most challenging parts of this journey we call life, we avoid, 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 and then suffer and repeat. So I was working in chemotherapy, we were going, and we had twins who were toddlers and a son. And of course, I was pretending I was fine right? I'm fine. I'm strong. I'm independent. I'm the glue, blah, blah, blah. And I just could no longer do it. It was like one chemotherapy patient after the other where patients were pulling me aside and saying, I don't want this chemo. I don't want this surgery. I don't want to go to the unit. And I literally would put my hands together and beg them, please talk to your doctor, talk to your family. And they would say, no, they don't want me to give up. And I just thought, okay, 
there's something really wrong here because we are not having these conversations. So I just innocently said, you know, <laughs> to doctors, nurses, social workers, all of us, are we well prepared for grief, death, and dying and, and good at having these real conversations? And they said, no, we're terrible at it. And I said, well, don't you think that's a problem? And they'd say, you know, go start that IV. Let's, let, let's not talk about this. Dan, I just couldn't ignore it anymore. So, is, so did that lead you to sort of take a pause on your clinical work and then write your book? Is that how that started? It's such a hilarious story. And, you know, um, and my husband, Jordy, is a paramedic. But we were like, you know, Tweedledee and Tweedledum because a nurse and a paramedic and I was walking and pacing around the house said, I don't know, we're not having these conversations. We need to do something. And there was a pop up on Facebook. You know, as many of us change our lives, there's a pop up on Facebook, how to write a best selling book. I said, oh my God, honey, that's it. I'm going to leave my 27 year nursing career and write a book. Isn't that fantastic? And his eyes, you know, he kind of like deer in the headlights glazed over and said, that's great, honey, except that like you're not a writer. He said, I know. Isn't it amazing? <laughs> I became that kooky author in the forest. I twins like go get your breakfast. Mama's got an idea. And and I just started pouring out all of these experiences and this heartache and suffering. And the greatest, most life changing thing for me was I sent out one email and I said, it's Yvonne Heath. Yep. I want to write a book. Once you finish laughing, please respond. I don't want surveys and statistics. I want people's true stories of being in the deep trenches of grief and illness and getting through to the other side and finding joy again in your lives. Will anyone share their stories? And I remember when I pressed sent and I was sitting right here and I thought, I don't even know if anyone will respond. And I bet you know what happened. That was in 2014 and the stories have not stopped coming. Wow. I was so shocked and in awe. People wanted to share their stories. They wanted to be heard. They wanted to be validated. And, and I've learned so much about forgotten grievers and buried and carried grief, right? That happened a long time ago. Why are you talking about that? Mom, you're going to a nursing home. It's okay. Why are you crying? Wait, you can't manage this house. And I shared people's stories in my book, ages 11 to 101. Wow. It was such a privilege to share those stories, to hear them. And I, there were laughs, there were tears, there were puppies, there, I was a hot mess and we allowed it all. And it was extraordinary. And, and that book, which is titled the same as your movement, Love Your Life to Death, mm -hmm. uh, it was a compilation of these stories and sharing this grief, but you've, you took the next step and tried to, and have made it into a movement. I've done a TEDx talk and I've, uh, or a speaker. I mean, what were the next steps after knowing all these stories was, was your hope uh, to, what was your hope with, with uh, sort of sharing these stories? My hope was, <laughs> again, I'm laughing because it was all just being very naive. It was one step at a time and just sort of being guided and not really knowing, you know, like Martin Luther King Jr. You don't have to see the whole staircase. I was writing this book. I was sharing these stories. And, and suddenly I felt this tremendous responsibility. These people shared from their heart and soul and their extraordinary, beautiful, heartwarming, heart-wrenching stories. I need to share them. And somebody said to me, you know, if you want people to read your book, you're going to have to become a speaker. And I said, well, that's a hard no, because I took a zero instead of speaking in front of my class. So that's a side note of you never know what you're capable of. If something scares you, go for it anyway. <laughs> no desire. And then the person who wrote my foreword said, well, why don't we, you know, have a love your life to death TV show? And I thought, well, that's hilarious as if they're going to say yes. And the producer said, oh, my goodness, that's a good, that's an amazing idea. So I turned around so he wouldn't see me cry because I was terrified. <laughs> and I just kept sharing stories. And it's just like what you and Sammy are doing. You're just saying, you know what, we need to be a part of this change. And, and you're sharing other people's wisdom and stories. And that is my superpower as well. Just like your kindred spirit. 
Yeah, for sure. Right? I'm so glad like, that's how we that's here. It. Yes, it's beautiful. And what I love the most about the two of you is your willingness to say, we don't have all the answers. Let's ask people and let's learn. And that's what I'm doing. I'm just the messenger. And so, you know, you're sharing stories of people who have, um, you know, experienced grief, heartache, really struggling against the system and the disease. But you've also turned it into a, a force, into something positive, into something that is funny. You know, the I just showed up movement, the hashtag I just showed up. Um, can you tell us more about that and how you're using this to bring people joy and overcoming grief or, or managing it in their daily lives? Mm -hmm. Oh, I just love these conversations. Well, the, what I found out and or what I realized as I, I dove into this is that grief and joy can coexist, right? And we, we, as a, we think it's one or the other. You get over the grief and then you get to the joy. And, you know, when, when do I, when I had one friend and it was so adorable because I'm now on the advisory council for the Elizabeth Kubler-Ross Foundation, which is also another tremendous honor. And, you know, Elizabeth wrote this one first book on death and dying 50 plus years ago and talked about stages of grief and the world just ran with them. Oh, my gosh. Great. You have five stages and, and, and then you're done. And that was never her intention. That was never what she said. She was just giving it context in these conversations and wrote 20 plus other books, never mentioned it again. And so as I was learning and and hearing all of this and and continuing to share these stories and learn more and more said so first of all we have to understand what grief is right and and what we have is we have no we have a big gap we're not proactive right we we don't talk about these things plan prepare and there is no such thing as, well, this is the day that my grief will be over. Thank goodness I can allow joy again. And my friend had said, you know, I went through the stages after my son died. I, I thought I would be done by now. It's been six months. And I said, oh, you're so adorable. <laughs> if only it worked that way. And it doesn't. It, it just, you, you weave it into your life. And you know that there will be grief attacks or grief moments 10 years down the road. And it's okay to allow the joy in again and and create it as you as you go along it isn't one or the other it's a roller coaster and you have to learn how to hang on through the dips and curves and uh, in in connecting with people who have been on these journeys and and who just realize like pat adams he says you know relieving suffering is a tremendous high i'm not there to fix it if i can make someone smile or laugh someone who is dying is still living so why not have, you know, I asked for a quote for my book and he said, if you got to die, why not make it fun? So in sharing the stories and realizing grief and joy can coexist. Uh, and I, I feel like my book is something that every adult or, you know, teen can read. And there's many books and we need many stories. You know, you don't, I have hundreds of books <laughs> and I hear, I, I've listened to, I binged your podcast. It kind of felt like a bit of a, a, a bit of a groupie because I was like, okay, I, I'm kind of stalking these people. I want to just be their friend and everything. But anyways, I digress. But I just thought, okay, now what we need to do is normalize these conversations at home, at school, at work, in our, in our compassionate communities. This isn't just healthcare professionals. Oh, let's leave that to the palliative care doctor. It's like, no, this is taking care of our are those who are ill, caregiving, dying, bereaved, marginalized, and those just having a bad day. It's, it's for all of us. It's, it's, mm -hmm. we can all do this. But I realized when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say is when I was so challenged and brokenhearted, people avoided me. So I said, when you don't know what to do, you don't know what to say, just show up. <laughs> just show up. It is the greatest gift that you can give someone. Well, what if I make them cry? But that's okay. <laughs> well, what if I don't know what to do or say? Say that. I have I have been to more visitations. I have visited people in hospice. I, like if I had well, for all the visitations, if I had a, a punch card, I could have a free funeral by now. I believe I've been there so often, and people say, "Well, I don't like going there." And I thought I and I say them, 
Well, I'm more concerned if people say, oh, I just love going to visitation. I mean, it's a little weird. <laughs> it's okay. Don't wait for it to be comfortable. Yeah. Just show up and be your hot, messy, imperfect, flawed self. Wow. I mean, I think, you know, you were sort of ahead of the curve with so many of these messages, right? And 10 years ago, and we're seeing how uh, more normal talking about grief is maybe today or that it's something that is maybe because of COVID, it's it's sort of in our face. I'm not sure if, uh, you know, palliative care and death and dying is more normalized, but people understanding that grief comes in waves and it isn't something to to be cured, so to speak. What, yeah, what have you learned from your journey so far that might have surprised you? Oh my goodness. I have learned so much. And the first thing is that you never stop learning. <laughs> that is like number one. So I am committed to ongoing lifelong learning unlearning and evolving right there's no time where when people say oh Yvonne Heath you are a an expert at all of this and now I'm just a human who struggles with grief like everyone else I just I am committed to learning and I I learned from so many different people and what the greatest thing I learned when in 2014 when I started this and it's hilarious because when you I would go to my fellow healthcare professionals oh my gosh you know I'm doing this don't you just want to be a part of the change isn't this so great and they would look at me like oh no thank you <laughs> no thanks I'm good and so to learn to let go and to work with those who are to, to share your message with those who are willing and able to hear it. And that's a challenge, right? Because there's all of these people that you, you want to help so desperately. And you, you know that we create our own excessive and avoidable suffering mm -hmm. by not normalizing these conversations. And I know we can do it differently. And so that letting go and... I have connected with the most beautiful humans around the globe, such as yourself and Sammy doing beautiful work. And so the more we connect and support one another, we're creating, this is about creating social change. Yeah. And it's nobody's fault. You know, that, that's the first chapter I wrote was, or whatever, second chapter. How did we get here? Like, how did we become so death phobic? And we were sort of blindly led, right? to we have complicated, sanitized, professionalized, and medicalized everything. Oh, you're struggling with a mental health issue? Well, you better talk to your therapist. Well, no, I just need my friend to listen, right? And that's why like in my TEDx talk, I was very intentional about saying I've had therapy. And if you do have therapy, it's one hour a, a week for six weeks. <laughs> Whatever you're struggling with, I promise you, it's not going to be fixed in that time. And, and working with Pallium Canada, where they are letting us know that we need to create our compassionate communities because the healthcare professionals are a part of your supportive, compassionate community in grief, in chronic illness, in the dying process. They're not going to be there 24-7. We need our compassionate communities. And that was a very eye-opening to really see, like it's five, 10, maybe 20% of the time, 20% if you're lucky. They're not yeah. going to be there 24 seven. Mm -hmm. And people, that is what people believe. And it's scary, isn't it? Yeah, for sure. And patients and families get overwhelmed and just don't know what they don't know. I mean, listening to you talk, I see so much overlap between the waiting room revolution and the love your life to death movement. Do you see it too? Oh my gosh. There's just so much. So first of all, it's funny because I had my show Real Life Talks and we, we've had the conversations with many of the same people and they're just such beautiful souls. The biggest thing I think um, is the fact that I think it was um, Elizabeth Doherty just said like we, we, we've we're sort of segmenting like, oh, this is curative medicine and then this is palliative and this is hospice. And, oh, I'm sorry, you need to go have that conversation with your palliative care team and whatever. And it's like, okay, wait a minute. <laughs> this is like our whole life journey. It's one journey. Let's all take good care of one another and stop fragmenting this, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's mm -hmm. what 
and 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 I even hear people say, oh, we're no longer going to um, provide care. It's like, oh gosh, like who would choose that? You know, palliative care is beautiful care, and and palliative care is just it's a philosophy. It's something that we're all we can all provide. Yeah. We, we're all a part of. And oh, when I hear. I mean, I've just heard your message. I know I'm nodding. You're <laughs> listening to the podcast. There's a lot of I'm nodding. Like, oh gosh, I hope no one's watching me. But um, when Sammy's like, I don't, you know, I, I we would like to be obsolete. Like, why have perhaps, you know, there's like the odd time when, oh, I need a specialist, whatever, but we're 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 pushing it. Oh, yes, this is a, oh, this isn't our responsibility. This is palliative care now. Yeah. Get back to that. This is our life's journey. Yeah. And it, that everyone has a role in, oh. uh, in doing it, but also everyone has the ability and the power, like you said, to, to just be there and just accompany the, the you know, people uh, in their life and, and just showing up can have a profound influence on happiness and, and closure and acceptance and their life. It's it's empowering when in this uh, on some level because you know it can be a very you know depressing on one level but on another it can really take we can take some of that power back because we can say no no this isn't the responsibility only by healthcare providers but we all can uh, contribute and we oh. it's sort of impact yeah we can take some of that power and not feel so helpless I think that's what I'm trying to say absolutely and here's here to me for me the biggest piece is that if we become proactive. So I say, I am a proactive living consultant. My dream would be to have proactive living consultants throughout the world who talk about plan and prepare before grief transitions end of life so that you, when I talk about just showing up, just show up for yourself first. When people say they have their pens ready and say, how do I get my dad to do his advanced care planning? I said, oh, well, have you done yours? Well, no, you know, I'm only this age. And I'm like, oh my God, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you we don't all die of old age and we don't all get a warning. So it's a lot easier to, to ask someone to do something if you've done it. It's a lot easier to face life, grief, and death and all the messiness in between if you have that foundation. What do you believe about life and death that will provide, give you comfort in your life and at end of life, choose to believe something great. I completely agree. We are trying to change a whole culture around this idea of mortality in big and small ways. And speaking of which, I follow you on social media, and I notice there's a stuffed elephant you bring around to all your events, as well as you, it, you often appear with a, a tambourine, I think. So can you explain the significance of those two things? The elephant is the elephant in the room, whether we want to or not. So Jasper, the elephant, travels with us everywhere we go. And the uh, tambourine is about me um, just showing up for myself first, because when I, when, you know, we, we try to make other people happy, we try to make other people do things, we try to fix them. And I know that I'm in charge of making my own music. Some of the funnest things I've ever done is be on stage playing the tambourine with bands, which I was not invited. I would see their tambourine and I would play it. And, <laughs> and this one band didn't have a tambourine. I said, that's okay. I brought my own. So, I love I, it. right. So, so that's part of my bringing heart and humor to everything because it's already serious enough. And I would love to share my call to action. Oh yeah, sure. That's a great way to end things off. What is your call to action? I, my call to action. So first of all, feel free to connect anytime through my love your life to death.com. And if you want to be empowered and resilient, and you want to be able to just show up for yourself and others, my call to action as always is plan your life plan your death, and then just love your life to death and always bring your own tambourine to the party. I love it. Yvonne, thank you so much for being on our podcast. Thank you so much. I think I'm going to have to come back. We have so much more to talk about. Same. Thanks. Take care. Bye. Bye for now. Well, hi, Alyssa. Welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me on your uh, podcast. So like Sammy, you're a palliative care doctor in the community, but you also are the co-founder of the Living Wish Foundation. It's a very cool, innovative idea that I think listeners will be inspired by. So can you tell us more about the foundation? Great. So um, the Living Wish Foundation is a national charity that I started um, 2019 with two of my nursing colleagues. Um, we, we all have worked in palliative care for many years. Um, and I think we all had this vision of our jobs being these deep, meaningful um, 
impactful conversations that would change the course of someone's final months and bring meaning to them. Um, and we realized that we just aren't set up to do that well. There's just too many other things that we have to accomplish as frontline care providers. Um, so we really wanted to start something that just really prioritized um, something that brings meaning and hope um, and, and the world outside of medicine back to someone's life when they're in their final phases of their illness. Um, so we're sort of like Make-A-Wish Foundation for Kids, only it's for adults. Um, as far as we could tell from our research, there like nothing like this existed for adults. I mean, there's small pockets of organizations doing similar work, um, but we really wanted to get the movement going to spread the word that um, that your your life matters. You, you're living until the very last breath, and and that's sort of what we've wanted to to create and emphasize. Was there a story that that was the origin that said? we can't let this happen. Like, where did the idea come? Like, what was the, the, the tipping point story that was like? Oh, so um, my, yeah, my, my, my key story I think of is, is this young soccer mom. You know, I, I went to her house with all the tools in my, uh, in my disposal to make her more comfortable. You know, like, oh, you can have paint pump and I'm going to fix this with oxygen. I'm going to fix this. I, I all, I thought I was going to fix everything. And all she wanted was um, was to get to her kids' home opener soccer game. It, that's all that mattered to her in the world. Um, and she was so tiny. She was so cachectic. I thought I could pick her up and put her in my car. Um, I, I just wanted to solve that problem for her. And, um, and we never did. And I thought it would be so great if there was an organization I could call that would say, oh, yes, this is what we do. So, you know, we have an ambulance that drives people to things they need to get to. Um, for their final wish. And, and now we have that ambulance and it's, it, you know, it's, it's great. I, I think about that mom all, all the time. I just wish we'd started, you know, a year earlier. So how many people have you touched with this last wish? Um, great. So probably over 50 people. Um, of course, like everything in the world, um, we faced some hurdles with COVID. Mm. Um, uh, so that kind of halted our growth, but I, I don't think it was a bad thing. Um, I think in this line of business, you have to think outside the box and it really required us to start thinking outside the box of like, how are we going to make these wishes happen? I mean, um, people come to us with a wish and they're at one phase of their illness and two weeks later when it's about to happen, they're at a different phase of the illness. So um, I think like the Webster's word of the year was pivot. So we had to do that. We have to do it all the time. COVID or not. Um, uh, so uh, the this year is going to be our year of growth. I think we've got COVID mm -hmm. down um, and and hopefully we can kind of double that this year, but but at least 50 for now. Okay. The listeners are definitely going to want to know what these wishes are all about. Like what's the scope and range and, you know, the craziest wish you've had so far that you've been able to um, deliver on? Uh, so this is like the unexpected best part of this is just hearing what matters to people most in their final weeks and days and months. Um, and it's really not like we thought it would be. And I think actually patients are surprised and, and families are surprised but by what people ask for. So um, first of all, we were relieved to know that nobody asked for Disney. Nobody has asked to go to Disney World yet, which was our worry when we kind of yeah. said we were like make wish. Um, but most of the wishes are really small. Um, most of them are about family and connecting. Um, a lot of them are about leaving legacy and meaning. So we've had a, we have a woman who creates um, bears, like um, handmade bears out of the clothing of someone's clothing to pass down to their children and grandchildren. Um, we've done legacy videos. We've had a lady who just goes to the home and, and writes stories with, with the person and letters that they can share. Um, things that we all imagine we would want to leave for our loved ones, but the reality is that you're too tired and sick to actually make that happen for yourself. Um, but the weird and wonderful and crazy things um, are have to say they're the animal wishes. So we had someone want to um, go to a wolf sanctuary. Um, 
we made that happen with Zoom um, <laughs> very safely. <laughs> um, we, we had someone have a visit from Birds of Prey in the hospice. And actually, while we had all these majestic birds come to hospice, we um, brought them to all the hospice patients. So everyone kind of got the wish of, a, of an eagle at their bedside. Um, we, we had a young girl um, who had snakes. We brought snakes to her room. Um, there is, so it's amazing how many weird animal wishes um, that we have intermingled. <laughs> it's almost like um, when I ask you, how many people have you touched with a wish? It's like there's a ripple effect because it's the person who's made the wish, but then the, the healthcare providers who are part of it and their families and the other um, neighbors get to, you know, benefit from their wish as well. So it really does have this exponential um, feel good spread to it, right? Absolutely. And the community, you know, we had budgeted in our first budget, oh, it's probably going to cost like $1,000 per wish. Mm -hmm. um, and the first wish we did was a backyard concert. Um, mm -hmm. Huge. Um, so like we're, we're basically like party planners, which, which is really fun. Um, and it cost us zero dollars because everyone we approached, the band did it for free. Someone donated flowers. Tim Hortons gave us the coffee. Um, an organization gave us the sandwiches. It, it, the whole community just feels good about making these things happen. It just reminds me of, um, you know, this idea that if it's, it's so terrible when for example, healthcare providers feel that there's nothing more we can do for you, you know, and um, we think because we don't have the next treatment or the next clinical trial uh, that, you know, we have no skin in the game, but we can see by the kinds of work that you're doing and the nurses that you work with everyone that it, there's always something we can do. It just may not come in the form of um, medicine or a treatment or a test, it might come in the form of listening to someone's wish and being able to participate in delivering on that. Um, that's the best medicine uh, at times has nothing to do. And it makes us feel good as providers uh, to be able to lean in. I, I also am picking up on the fact that um, I, I'm assuming that often these wishes are identified rather late in the illness journey. As you mentioned hospice, and we know in Canada, people go to hospice usually in their last weeks or months of life. Um, and how important it is that if many of the wishes are coming from a place of wanting to leave legacy um, or reconnecting with family and building on relationships, how so important it is for us to pepper in to people's illness journey, the reality of where their illness is headed so that they have more time than just when they're in a hospice to be seeing some of this stuff come true for them. Like I'm thinking I have the right, if I have an illness to know that it's headed in a certain direction, because if at the end, my wishes are going to be around making sure I leave this or that for people or scrambling to do all of these amazing things that I'd like to be able to do that along the entire, entire illness, but I can only do that if the healthcare providers are honest with me about what's happening. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. And you know, it's interesting when I said we've done 50 wishes, I would say that 50% of the time, the wishes never get done because they come too late to us. That's wow. so sad. Yeah. And I think it's a reflection of patients not being, not being told up front. And I, and I, I know that that's a, a running theme through the podcast that we're echoing the importance of, of honesty so we can um, know what's ahead. But I also think our society as a whole doesn't want to talk about it. You know, we, we you know, it's, it's the caregivers that it, it's the, the final thing, the final answer is there. And they say, oh, well, let's do something. Whereas you know, we have these opportunities to reach these people sooner, I, you know, um, and, and we're really missing them. So this is going to be one of our plugs for the coming year is really identifying wishes earlier so that people don't miss out on their chance. Amazing. I love that the wishes you've described aren't about extravagant things, but really are about things that have meaning in people's lives. And that makes the idea of, of coming together and granting these final wishes something that I believe will be attainable for communities everywhere, not just in places that, you know, have connections. Yeah, it's a, it's a reminder that you don't have to run a national charity to do it, 
right? Um, you know, it, there, it, it just takes someone asking. And I think we're more, we're more likely to ask if we have something we can offer. So I'm encouraging physicians in our community just to ask, like ask your patients because there is a, you can follow it up with, oh, wouldn't that have been, you know, yes, we can make that happen as opposed to, well, well, that's lovely, but we won't get you to see it. I'm, I'm not going to get a hawk to your bedside, but yes, we can. So, mm-hmm. yeah. Do you see as a, as a, as a clinician, as a doctor, do you yeah. see some of the barriers of why people don't ask about what matters most and what it's not even the wish, but the, like what is important to them as opposed to just focusing on the treatment. I mean, is that something you see in your colleagues and, and, and the reasons behind that? Oh, for sure. I mean, um, you only have so long in a patient encounter and the first things you're going to address are the, the symptoms, um, you know, and then you've got to deal with the families um, and the caregiver burnout. Um, and then if you get to it, then it's okay. Well, then we'll talk about what might happen next week and what's our plan for down the road. Um, and, and, and it, it is, it isn't always prioritized as top of the list to say, well, you know, what can we do to bring you joy next week? Assuming we get your pain better. You know, it, it, it's not always the, one of the first things we ask, but, um, I, I find knowing that it's tucked in the back of my head that I can make this happen. All I have to do is listen to their story and pick up on something. And then at the end say, and there's one last thing I want to say, you mentioned that you have the secret vanity about your hair. And then I give them my card and say, I run a charity that makes wishes happen. And if your wish is to have your hair done, just so you feel that great, I just came out of the salon feeling, you know, here, simple, just apply. And, and it's, um, it's a lovely thing to be able to, to leave with, right? And how does it make you feel? Oh, it's great. I mean, um, it forces me to listen carefully to all those details that make the person who they are as a person, right? And to and, and I mean, that's, I think, what we all love when we do palliative care. We all look for that anyways. But to know that I can take that and, like, really bring it to life is, I mean, that's that's why we do what we do, right? I feel like we do that well in hospices, not to the extent that you guys are doing it. Because of this idea of mortality awareness, by the time someone's in a hospice, people pretty much know what the big deal is, uh, like the real meal deal is, like where we're at in the illness journey. Um, If you don't know that and you're in a hospice, there's a big problem. But I think think part of the hesitation of people delving into these types of areas, in addition to time and et cetera, et cetera, is just like this whole problem we have with not being um, aware of our own mortality and that it is continues as we all know as the elephant in the room the the thing that's not being talked about and it's just so busy trying to figure out how to fix someone and treat someone and go for the next test or the next treatment clinical trial whatever it's going to be until that weird moment where people are labeled palliative and then all of a sudden it's like Okay, shifting lanes mm-hmm. here, a big U-turn. Uh, okay, now I guess I'm dying. And <laughs> there's something about mortality awareness that becomes um, important for people to start talking openly. Yeah, for sure. And I think in some ways, clinicians can be the worst for it. You know, if, if they, they'd rather kind of still focus on what we can, you know, on solving the problem as opposed to just sitting and talking about something that they can't fix for someone. Mm. Um, but people have priorities beyond living longer. Yeah. And, and I think our as physicians are trying to make everyone live as long as possible. You're absolutely right. Yeah. I think in palliative care, what we're really good at is just sitting with the unknown uh, in the gray zone, in the twilight zone, neither here nor there. We just, <laughs> we can be. Yeah in the moment and soak it all in and be present without necessarily having a fix or the answer or the end goal in mind. And Mm -hmm. I think many clinicians are trained to move forwards or, you know, there's got to be, you know, a goal in mind or, but I think in palliative care, we can just be. And when you, uh, 
when you do that, you can listen better mm-hmm. and hear what's most important to people. Yeah, absolutely. And, and live in the moment and be present in the moment. So this is what your want is now. Let's make that happen now. Can you remind us again, like what are the areas in Ontario that your foundation serves? South Georgian Bay, but we have come down to Hamilton. We've got, we go up to Muskoka. We did Goderich. Like we will go wherever. If a listener was listening and saying, that's amazing. I want to create something similar and Living Wish Foundation in my community. What advice would you have for them? of how to get started. Yeah, so in the back of my head, um, yet to be put down into a formal business plan, I have, I have grand plans for um, how to bring other communities, how to, how to create chapters. Um, but we've mentored a few communities and I think the underlying theme that I'm getting is that we just want other communities to do this. We don't need it. It doesn't have to be part of the Living Wish Foundation. Mm-hmm. Um, what you need to do is get, um, a group of like-minded, passionate people who are willing to work off the side of their desk and spread the word and make wishes happen. And in whatever form it happens, it will grow because people love telling the stories Mm -hmm. and then more people know, and it grows. Um, And I think there's probably a number of different ways we could have started this. We could have started through the hospital, through the hospice, you know? um, So I think just start asking patients and making it happen in the community and spreading the word and it, and it will grow. I love that, Alyssa. That's why I feel it because that's what, you know, that's the connection to waiting room revolution. We wanted to take the power back and give information, knowledge is power to patients and families and say, you don't have to feel helpless. Like you can just start, ask this, know this, do something different tomorrow. And that's exactly what you're saying that if we just ask the patients what they want and we find a way and listen and just, you know, honor the wish. It doesn't have to be exactly the way they said it, but uh, we can have a meaningful impact on the experience and not just for the patient, but their whole family um, who have to, yeah. to survive uh, the moment and this illness. So I think um, it's, it's really exciting the kind of impact, uh, you know, these little dreams can have because they can, they just can ripple and spread out. So I think it's awesome. So last question, Alyssa, what's your hope for the future? Um, so right now, I want this to become, I I want everyone in our community to know that they can have a wish. I want everyone to benefit from the joy of one last wish. Everyone in patients, families, communities, their doctors. I just want the good feeling about it to spread and it to be an expectation. Um, So that's that's my simple wish. Um, I would love for this to impact every community. I think every community would benefit from this. So that's it. Yeah. That every patient benefits from the joy of one last wish. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you guys. This has been so lovely. Thanks for listening. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe if you haven't already. You can visit our website, waitingroomrevolution.com to learn more about our movement and how you can join it. The podcast is produced by myself, Kayla McMillan, Valerie Bishop, Shopa Jyothi Kumar, and Maggie Sivak. Our theme music is Maypole by Ketza.